the top. And I'll probably do two eight-minute segments with you. I might go three, but I'll do two eight minutes. And I may or may not go to the phones. I'm not a great believer in spawning a good interview for the sake of telephone calls. Okay. Which may or may not be good. Okay. And uh, can uh, you want me to keep my responses, you know, to two or three sentences, or if something's complicated, do you like? develop it? Okay. But don't, I'll cut you off you anyway if you're too complicated. I, nine, I do 90 minutes live I've a day. I've got some scissors. You <laughs> love it, love it. No. Here, you know you got scissors, great. He's here, Just clip it across. But he he's, wants it done. No, he's an American, okay? It doesn't matter how they look. <laughs> yeah, no, when you're supposed to be technically correct and you have okay. hair flopping down over your collar, it looks like you've got your facts torn. Not a question. I ran into a judge yesterday afternoon who said, Webster, you're a horrible bastard. You know as well as I do this, that. I said, look, we don't speak to his relatives. Yet some days you don't feel you so occasional irregular. That's when Correctol can help. A laxative made with a woman in mind. Correctol is formulated with a special softening agent. Its effective overnight action will help you feel like yourself again. Next time, try Correctol. A laxative made with care for today's woman. Coming up next, Webster. Good morning. It's the day after the disaster at M Creek, in which all these people were killed and others missing. And on the scene at dawn this morning was reporter Steve Wyatt. How did it look this morning out beyond Lions Bay, Steve? It looks pretty well the same, Jack. They have been working all night long trying to get the Bailey Bridge in, in, installed. And uh, they did clear away the mud over the railroad tracks down below, so the trains are running again through there. Uh, here's the Bailey Bridge now. They've been working all night long. Uh, an optimistic estimate is that it'll be open for traffic by Friday afternoon. Probably the more realistic one is Saturday morning because they've had to bring parts for it from all over the world practically, some from Ireland and even England. And they've actually flown the stuff in. That's right, yeah. Now, what about footings for that bridge? Did they put in new concrete footings or is the span long enough to cover the gap with some safety? The span is long enough right now and there are no new footings in. And I've been hearing rumblings from people who live in the Squamish area about these wooden footings on these bridges. They're a bit worried about them. Does this particular, we, we hope to see the film later in the program this yeah. morning once it gets handled, but does the footing, does the, the metal span of the Bailey Bridge at the moment cover, traverse the entire length of the previous wooden bridge. Yes, it will, ultimately. They're just moving it across now on big rollers, but it will be the same way. It'll be right across yes. and clear on each side and obviously usable for some form of highway traffic. That's right, yeah. After mm -hmm. they've tested the weight and the suspension and all the rest of it. Right. In the meantime, extra trains are uh, taking commuters. Here are the train tracks now. They were cleared overnight. Uh, their BCR is running extra passenger trains from Squamish. To Two bad trains, I believe, a day right. each way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Oh, there we are. There's now, the water now. now. It's gone down a bit because they've managed to clear away some of the rubble and it's going down underneath that, uh, underneath the tracks Can I again. see that they're just pushing the Bailey Bridge across the span at this moment? That's right. You can just see it to the right of the screen there. They're just slowly pushing it across. They figured they'll be done by late tomorrow afternoon. 
staggering to find out yesterday on the film that, in fact, we do have bridges with uh, big enough timbers, but bridges subject to be swept away by whatever comes down from the country up above. Yeah, 40-foot 40, uh, 40 wall of mud. But at the same time, uh, some people have been hearing grumblings that, uh, you know, if this had been concrete, maybe it hadn't, wouldn't have happened. If it had been a total concrete span big enough. That's right. We might need 20 of these on that very dangerous highway right. to make sure that there are no more log jams That's right. on the base of wooden bridges. That's right. What about the, um, the recovery of bodies efforts today? Had they started yet when you left there, what, 8.10? I left about 8.10 and they hadn't begun yet, although they were arriving. They're looking for probably four more bodies. There are two cars still missing, one a Toyota with a, one a Toyota and another pickup truck, and a man and a woman were in the pickup truck. There's the RCMP and some of the railroad people still working in the area. This was shot just about an the hour ago. The creek is now down to normal because it's That's jammed right. up logs. We saw some of the big fed logs yesterday, which obviously played a, played a part in pushing out the, the footage. That's right. The creek looks harmless this morning. Oh, it does. It looks uh, placid again all of a sudden. One is, yeah. I think, entitled. There's a car. There's one of the that's cars. That's this morning's picture. Yeah, now that's the one closest to the bridge. Now down below that, I'd say about 20 feet, there are another three cars and even a house that you remember was we pushed out, out yesterday. into House Sound, yeah. We thought for a moment that the man had died in that house, but That's both right. he and his dog escaped. That's right. Okay, Steve, keep me up to date on it, and we'll see the film of Do a Rape, Please, before the end of the program. Okay, good. Steve Wyatt. On the program this morning, we're going to have a serious session with an M a man from MIT. His name is Jonathan King. And he comes into town at a very appropriate time. Although I do not support the hysteria of Greenpeace and you know, attacking the U.S. nuclear carrying ranger, which is coming in tomorrow afternoon. It is appropriate because in the studio this morning is Jonathan King, who is one of the science scientists for peace in the United States, and who is himself a molecular biologist at MIT, and I'm sure he's going to fill us with more gloom that we don't need, but we've got to face it up to, because this is United Nations Disarmament Week, and that's the reason there have been all these huge protests in Europe, Jonathan King. After that, we're going to meet Craig Patterson, who has suddenly become the kind of outside expert in the compensation board. And I have a couple of straightforward questions to put at Craig Patterson. I don't like, quite know where he's at or what he's at, but he's certainly well informed on the Workman's Compensation Board. Towards the end of the program, we'll be crisp with Crispo. But first, Jonathan King on World Disarmament Week of the United Nations after the break. This side of the Rocky Mountains and above the 49th parallel, we do detend, we do um, sometimes become myopic and short sighted on international affairs. But every now and again, I'm watching the television, and I see Reagan, and I say to myself, with the best will in the world, I'm more afraid of the President Reagan than I am of Brezhnev in the United Nation, in the United USSR, because of the incredible drive which is on the United States now for the MX missiles, the sale of the AWACS to Saudi Arabia, the guarantees in the Middle East, the possible problems in Poland, where 10 million people stopped for an hour yesterday. So I kind of welcome this morning a jab at my conscience and perhaps your conscience from Dr. Jonathan King, one of the people in, the, in at the beginning of the Science for Peace program in the American Association for the Advancement of Such Science. And he's from MIT himself. Now, tell me, am I being a yellow-bellied, weak-kneed, nervous Canadian when I look at the country to the south of us, which I do regard as our shield and shelter in real times of trouble? Am I right or wrong to be nervous about this man, Reagan? I think you're absolutely right, because the, the weapons buildup that he's pushing, which is the largest weapons buildup in really in the history of the United States, in the history of the world, is going to do nothing to increase United States security, and it's going to do nothing to increase Canadian security. It's just going to decrease it, because there's no defense against nuclear weapons, right? You can't defend yourself against But I thought them. the defense was the massive deterrent of the major powers, <laughs> that they are both so incredibly powerful, despite this, what do you call this window? Uh, vulnerability. The, the window, window of vulnerability, vulnerability that right. no, even mad politician would dare to press a button. Well, but w that was the U.S. policy, mad, mutual assured destruction. 
but we've changed our military policy with the issuance of something called PD-59, Presidential Defect Directive 59. And now the policy is that we have to prepare to fight a nuclear war, to launch a nuclear war, to launch a nuclear attack. You mean Reagan has taken the posture in your serious that, that view of a preemptive strike if necessary? Not only has he taken it, but that's the reason for spending $50 billion on the MX missile, which differs from the previous mi missiles in that it has pinpoint accuracy, 200 meters, hit a target 200 meters in diameter after 5,000 miles. Now, these missiles are so powerful. Have they tested these missiles? <sighs> well, I mean, they, do they know they can hit 5,000 miles within 600 Feet? Well, let me say that the, the best of American and Canadian scientific intellectual talent has gone into designing these, the, these missiles. You You're know, one of them, perhaps. Uh, well, some of my students. And uh, maybe it's not 200 meters, maybe it's 300 meters. But it's very clear what those missiles are for. They're to hit Soviet missiles in their silos. There's no point in launching a missile in an empty silo. So the only reason you want pinpoint accuracy, because the weapons destroy everything for miles and miles around. And the only reason you'd care about whether you hit here or five streets over is if you want to knock out a missile in its silo. And the only way to do that is in a first strike. Isn't part of this $50 billion, you said? $50, 50 billion. billion. dollars. Isn't part of this $50 billion program, I couldn't resist a little sardonic snicker when I noticed that your country had scrapped the removable railway target, uh, uh, rather operational basis. That's they were right, going to build race huge track. railways, race right, tracks, right. with missiles moving it all the time. Now, that's been scrapped. That's been scrapped, but the missile has not been scrapped. No, Just but the, the basing mode has been scrapped. Okay, but to protect your missiles, apparently you're going to build them up with massive amounts of concrete in the old vulnerable sites. Uh, yeah, yeah. well, it, clearly it's absurd, right? If, if, if the old sites are vulnerable, they're going to be vulnerable with the new missiles in them. If the sites can be made invulnerable, you don't need a new missile. You can do it with the old missiles. So you just cannot understand these policies except as an offensive policy. Now, $50 million into missiles 50 is billion. 50 billion. Is 50 billion that's taken out of the rest of the economy. And that is what is driving inflation in the United States. That is what is driving up the interest rates in the United States. And that is what's driving up the interest rate here in British Columbia. You, in you're going to tell me now that that's the reason half our lumber industry has closed down. That's exactly what I'm going to tell you, because what it's led to in the United States is the biggest depression in the housing industry in 30 years. There's almost no new construction in the housing industry. There's no housing sales. And I, I don't know what percentage of your forest products industry goes to build housing in the United States, but it's the largest sector. About 60%. All right. So now you know why they're not selling any wood products, because there's no houses being built. But, uh, let, let me go back. I'm no, no economist, mm -hmm. said he. But let me go back. $50 billion being pumped into the economy, mm -hmm. you know, Creating massive jobs, uh, but creating not. But you can't, you know, with a, with a missile, it doesn't clothe you, doesn't house you, doesn't feed you, doesn't take you to work, and you can't manufacture anything with it. It doesn't do anything to increase the productive component. It of must the economy. just be spent. Yeah, but, but the the wages go into the economy, but there's nothing for them to buy because you cannot go out and buy an MX missile when you're short of housing or transit. So that is the most inflationary dollar in the in the North American economy. And Canadians cannot insulate themselves by saying, well, it's happening across the border because your, your economy is coupled to ours. With a $50 billion expenditure, there's no way that anyone there but in this continent can cope, uh, can foresee a reasonable deflation and reduction in interest that's, rates. That's right. And our position in the United States is that, I mean, we've gone around to people, for example, in Boston and said, if you want decent housing and schools and health care and Social Security and a chance for a future for your kids, you are going to have to oppose the MX missile and the B-1 bomber because that is the only way to save the standard of living, you know, at the present time. Well, you've got something going in the States called the Jobs with Peace campaign. Is, uh, this is, a, is this a political campaign? This is a political campaign, but it's a referendum. It's on the ballot in, oh, in it's Boston. A, it can't be a Proposition 13 type thing. Uh, it's like Proposition 13, yeah, but unfortunately it's not binding. It's just, uh, it's just a political statement. But what it does, it allows you to go to people with literature that makes the connection between their declining standard of living, the increased in interest rates, and the increasing war danger. And to kind of rebuild a constituency in the United States who understands that weapons do not mean jobs. Military spending con con produces fewer jobs per dollar than spending in any other sector of the economy. And you said to me earlier, the Canadian economy was buoyed by war production. Well, if you had put the 10 billion into housing and schools and transit, you would buoy the economy just as much and you'd improve life much buoy, more. Buoy, 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 buoy. Boy. 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 Boy.
Boy. Sorry. I had said earlier, I know, well, you know, the Second World War made the industry and created prosperity in this country during the war and after the war for some time. But I'm saying if you had had a national housing policy and a national transit policy and you'd spent taxpayers' dollars there, you would have, you know, beefed up your industry just as well. And your industry is not doing that well. Why doesn't Canada have, you know, a, a civilian electronics industry like Japan and, and West Germany? Because a lot well, of... Well, I'll tell you if you like. Because much of our secondary industry is owned and controlled by the United States. The research and development has been done in the United States. And the moment we attempt to take back ownership from the United States of anything, you people get in a snit and come after us with great jabs and make threats about banning the importation of our lumber altogether. I, I'm not among those you, right? That's a, that's a sector that, that owns the American economy. Well, I'm giving you I a kind of broad it. Canadian yeah. view on the particular yeah. subject. Yeah. But what, give yourself a political flavor. Uh, I'm not being a McCarthy. Uh, Just tell me what yeah, you are. Yeah, left wing of the Democratic Party, or kind of Canadian Democratic liberal. Democratic Socialist. Oh, yeah. uh, NDP. Probably. NDP. NDP. Yeah. There aren't very many of you around in the states, are there? Uh, if there, if if they don't get to be a lot more of us, we're all going to get we get blown away. I like this fellow, Dr. Jonathan King, an American Democratic Socialist. First time I've met one straight <laughs> up, I think, on camera after the break. I do plead guilty to lack of action on the question of the end of the world. Who wouldn't rather be red than dead? We had a prime minister who once said he'd rather be red than dead. Oh, he was in opposition at the time. Lester Pearson. Time of uh, the fight between our control or your control of the old-fashioned missile. And he was castigated from one end of the continent to the other. But question, yesterday. Yeah, it was yesterday. Well, he's a hero to some of us. Lester Pearson? Yeah. He was ripped apart by Lyndon Baines Johnson like, treated like a dog. Yeah, well, Lyndon Baines Johnson also got 50,000 Americans killed in Vietnam, so I'm not sure that he's... Uh, John F. Kennedy played a part in that, that too, didn't that's he? That's true, that's true. It was a policy of the government, no matter who was in there. And it was Nixon that got you out. Uh, I'm not sure it was Nixon that got us out. I think it was a kind a of protest. a social movement that got us out, and plus the, the anyway, Vietnamese. Anyway, terrify me some more. I saw Reagan last night gloating over the fact that he got a congressional note, I think it was 52 to 48, something mm -hmm. like that, to give the AWACS, to sell the AWACS to Saudi Arabia. What does that mean to you? Well, look, Saudi Arabia, it's 1981 and they have an absolute monarchy, right? It's one of the most reactionary forms of government uh, in the world. And to be put in the position where, where we as Americans are supposed to be supporting the most reactionary monarchy, and why? so that, you know, mobile can have Saudi oil, right? And then when Reagan says, we will make sure that there won't be any social upset in, in, in Saudi Arabia, well, you know, that's their oil and it's their country and it's their people. And to send them uh, the most sophisticated military weaponry that we know how to produce is just to almost ensure that there's going to be military confrontation in the Middle East. It just decreases world security. It is crazy. Well, when he said that yesterday, when he made these commitments later on, he merely meant that the United States will, if necessary, occupy Saudi Arabia to prevent any infringement from Iran or Iraq or the Soviet Union. Is that correct? Uh, yes, but it's more likely to prevent any infringement from the Saudi people themselves, right? Who because knows what is infringement and what isn't in these days? Uh, I mean, any, any American I talk to up here, I sometimes wonder if he's also an agent for the CIA. You excluded, of course. Uh, thank, <laughs> you. thank you, thank you. <laughs> well, there's no doubt that we're building up this huge we weapons force, the Rapid Deploy Deployment Force, which is essentially a floating invasion army ready to intervene <coughs> at a moment's notice. And from a military point of view, it cannot be that the role of those forces are to prevent the Soviet stopping the oil flow. Because if the Soviets want to stop the oil flow, they just sink one ship in the Straits of Hormuz or just bomb the refineries. What that Rapid Deployment for is to intervene in internal political disruption, as American forces have done in Dominican Republic, Nicaragua, Lebanon, etc. And it's not there to defend the oil fields from the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union exports oil. In fact, after Saudi Arabia, they're the second largest producer. If we're really worried about the oil, you know, we'd send the Soviets drilling technology so they can get more of their own oil. And it's clear that that's a phony uh, justification. I want to get back to your jobs for peace, but I just want to ask you one question, which one normally doesn't ask. Are you totally in favor of the absolute guarantee for the state of Israel? 
uh, from the U.S. government? No. You're not? No. How can you possibly be against the continued existence of the State of Israel? No, you, you asked me a different question. Right. You said the absolute guarantee. Does that mean that if they go and, and invade Saudi Arabia, we'll support them? I mean, I'd support my own government, not if they send an invasion force into Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, so the idea that one would absolutely guarantee any nation, regardless of their military adventurism, seems to me is the giving up your prerogatives as a responsible citizen. So many madmen about the world today, from yeah. Gaddafi up yeah. and down, yeah. one just doesn't, doesn't be, perhaps most people like myself think, oh, I just don't want to think about it. I don't want to do anything. I just want to hide my head, try and pay my mortgage, and forget the whole thing. Well, but you know, you mentioned your mortgage. It, you, you, you know how to, how to raise the issues of that you don't like mortgage rates, right? I mean, that's something that's close to home and people relate Yeah, we to. can scream at politicians. You can scream at politicians. Now, the trouble is the nuclear weapons issue has always been put way off in the distance, out of the hands of ordinary people. But the fact of the matter is that it can't be disconnected from the mortgage interest, right? If you want your mortgage rates to go down, you're going to have to have your local politicians oppose, you know, supporting the military buildup. And the Jaws of Peace campaign, for example, you know, is a way to say to people, look, this issue is not so far away as you think. Mm -hmm. It's connected to your everyday life in terms of the economics right now, and it's connected to your life and the ch life of your children in the sense that if you don't want them to fry. This is what we're all looking for, though. In your Jobs for Peace, you say you want quality education, public transportation, energy efficient housing, improved health care, and cut the amount of tax dollars spent on nuclear weapons and programs of foreign military intervention. Will that pass in Boston? I think it'll pass in Boston. But in Canada, in Canada, we need something else. I mean, I think Americans need to see Canadians taking a stand, you know, calling for a nuclear weapons-free zone, supporting disarmament in the United Nations. Canada has a very strong tradition of internationalism. And you didn't build nuclear weapons, right? You could have, but you, but you didn't. So Canada is one of the few nations in the world. That we has sell certain, materials which can make them. Can uh, do reactors to India. Well, so we need. And a they had a bomb. We need a campaign in Canada to make sure can that Canada does not. Can do reactors to uh, South Korea. I think the other one was, was Argentina. Your hands are not are not unsullied. Well, you I think see, during the Vietnam War, we all kept it very quiet, but. The, this half a billion dollars or whatever it was we got in secondary military production was very useful. Yeah, yeah. During the yeah, Vietnam War. Yeah, but you do better off with the housing products, with the forest industry's production. Give me that again on the forest. You're saying, but then who's going to, you're, you're looking for Valhalla. In the United States or in the docile ally, allies in Western Europe, who is well, not no, going uh, to meet their commitments? Okay, now, first place, let's remember that in the last week, there have been the largest demonstrations all across Europe that there have been in 30 years, right? A quarter of a million people in London, a quarter of a million people in Italy and France, all over Europe, people are saying, no, we don't want a world in which we're going to get blown to smithereens in the next 10 years. Canada has an opportunity to take a position to make Canada a place where nuclear weapons cannot be transported, to make it a nuclear weapons-free zone or manufactured or sold. It has an opportunity to fight in the United Nations for an international surveillance force, to, you know, for, for treaties. <coughs> and that's something that's going to have to start locally. You know, it's going to have to start in the Vancouver City Council and the B.C. Parliament and the B.C. I Federation. I get so mad at the well. City Council when they pass revolutions, uh, resolutions in Afghanistan. I'm wrong, perhaps. Well, but, but it, what happened in Afghanistan didn't have anything to do with the forest products industry and mortgage rates in But the in expenditure of $50 billion by the U.S. military establishment, supported by Democrats and Republicans, is what's cutting our economic throat now. That's right. That's right. It's cutting your economic throat now. And, of course, you're a target. I mean, you're a military target. And if the Soviet Union gets, begins to believe Reagan, right, what, what can they do? All they can do is build up similar we weapons and threaten to launch a first strike against the United States, in which Vancouver will be just vaporized. Okay? And not only Vancouver, but Toronto, Ontario. Oh, well, we've got the big nuclear plant up in Washington State against our southeastern border, Hanford. We've got the Trident base. Right. I mean, you are a military target. In fact, for, for people in British Columbia to believe that they're not right smack in the middle of the nuclear arms race is just absurd because they're right at ground One zero. One final question. You're a member of the Democratic Party. Yes. Uh, you have no hope in the United States of having a democratic socialist government within how many hundred of years? Because of your great tradition of free enterprise and self-initiative and the, them uh, as has as, gets. As a matter of fact, there is the beginning of a third party movement in the United States, a labor party movement. And at the last, for example, in Massachusetts, the last state labor council, AFL-CIO, 
there were strong resolutions brought in to split off the labor movement from the Democratic Party, because the Democratic Party hadn't been responsive, and to have an independent party of labor, which would also be a peace party, right, of the peace movement and the labor movement. How do your scientific colleagues feel about the political action involved? Well, the scientific community is getting into gear. And as a matter of fact, on November 11th, across the United States at 140 campuses, there are going to be teach-ins on the threat of nuclear war, uh, organized primarily by, initiated by physicists, chemists, and biologists who are feeling that they can no longer be silent on this, you know, on this use of their talent and their knowledge for destruction. <coughs> and, and that's quite important. Dr. Jonathan King, breath of fresh air. Uh, October the 30th, that's Friday, 8 p.m., First Baptist Church, Barad and Nelson in Vancouver. You can hear King and Lina Voklas, a native spokesperson for victims of weapon testing in the Pacific from New Guinea. I gotta say the best of luck. Thank you. Do Thank the you. job that some right. of us don't have the conscience to do. Oh, no, you're doing your work here by talking about it. Next, uh, Craig Patterson, after the break. Craig, Craig Patterson <coughs> has emerged in the last couple of years as an informed spokesman on the problems of the Compensation Board. Sometimes I think he overdoes it a little bit, but I wanted Craig to come this morning, which he has done, to talk specifically about certain issues. Oh, uh, just informally, first of all, you might explain to me, and I don't want to make a big fuss about it. I saw, I had a report the other day about uh, a fight over a monument for these four poor guys who were killed falling off the Bentall Tower. Explain that fight to me. Are you being unreasonable? Is Bentall being unreasonable? Is the park board being stupid? These four men died that tragic death, and you've been acting for the families, right? Yes. I, I, I couldn't quite grasp what was happening over this argument about a monument. Well, I can't quite grasp it myself. Uh, the, the families got together, Jack, and with the Bentals, as a matter of fact, and decided that they should have a memorial to those workers. It was important to have something like that uh, to remind the public of the event, to try and put in people's minds that this sort of thing should be prevented. They agreed that they should have a simple plaque it's not a huge monument or anything. It's a simple plaque, a foot and a half by a foot and a half. The Bentals kindly agreed that they would uh, pay for its installation. And they all decided that the best place for it would be in Discovery Park, which is that little park. Oh, a little decorative green space That's outside right. the new building. That's right, on Burrard. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we applied with the Bentals to the Parks Board for approval to put Jointly, it Jointly, the Bentals yeah. and the family, yeah. mm -hmm. to put the little plaque outside the building. Well, in the park, in, yeah, in Discovery the park. park, across mm -hmm. right across the street from the, the whole center, mm -hmm. in the middle of that in that canyon of huge high-rise buildings, all built by construction workers, right. which is the exact point of it. And we applied to the Parks Board in July. The Parks Board uh, turned us down uh, and suggested that it should go on the building. They didn't hear from the families at the time. I don't think that they really understood the significance of the thing to the families. And so now it's back in front of the Parks Board on Monday night. And can't they make up their minds? <coughs> what do they want to do? Well, I don't... I or do they, so they probably come up with arguments like, uh, if we do that, we'd have little monuments in every park in the city because somebody was killed in a traffic accident at the end of the street? Well, the, we have parks that are full with monuments now, but I'm quite sure that on Monday night the Parks Board will approve it. Oh, I'm quite so sure that they too. will. Russ Fraser, isn't it? He's the chairperson. He's the chair, chairman of the Parks Board. If it's a woman, I'll say chairwoman. <laughs> but I'm so that's all it is. Bentles and the family got together. That's right. Bentles said, "We'll make it. We, we, we'd like to see it there." They would have put it on the building if you wanted, I suppose. Well, they don't. They don't own that whole square. They have joint partners that they'd have to go through. But I'm sure that if the families insisted that it be on the building site, that the Bentles would do everything they could to make sure it was if there. If it makes the families happier and the tragic circumstances so much, the better. Exactly. Fair enough. No fight on that. What the <coughs> devil is happening on the compensation board? Well, there's lots of things happening. They've been happening for a long time, and there's going to be lots more happening, too. One thing I couldn't understand, I hope this isn't in detail, well, you'll tell me, you'll warn me off if I'm getting too close to courts or actions. <laughs> I always understood, and this applies to all compensation cases, I'm sure, 
that compensation was brought in specifically to avoid the necessity for workmen's families having to sue in the courts. <clears throat> and that you, as a survivor of an industrial accident, you were presumably treated squarely and fairly under the regulations and collected your pension and benefits right. without having to sue anybody. But you made a big, big story the other day about you were unhappy with the compensation board because you want to take some other l law action which would have seen these families being temporarily denied the benefits they presently get. Now, what are you trying to do? Because surely if you accept compensation, that's the be-all and end-all of the compensation for the families. I'm trying to be clinical. No, well, it isn't. Am I not right in my basic premise? Well, your basic premise is correct, yes. Now, if I get compensation for an accident, I, as a worker, lose the right to sue. Again, you lose the right to sue your employer. And you lose the right to sue a fellow worker. Interestingly, historically, Jack, to show you where the legislation comes from, you've lost the workers lost the right to sue their employer. But they got compensation paid by the employer. Contributed to by a tax fund, yes, a tax on production. Right. They lo they've lost the right to sue the employer since 1917. Uh -huh. They didn't lose the right to sue fellow workers until 1974 which is very interesting. But that has gone now. That's right. So in this case, for example, the widows cannot sue under the Families Compensation Act, cannot sue the, the Dominion Construction Company owned by the Benthals, and who that is the accept. employer of the carpenters. That you accept? Well, we're not raising that issue right now. Right, that's, okay. Okay, we, that's a given. However, the, the inquest clearly revealed that the manufacturer of the fly forms that fell off the building had improperly designed them and hadn't properly supervised their use on the job site. Got that. Okay? Mm -hmm. Gross negligence, really. Right. The jury found that, and there were engineers in the jury. Now, they are not the employer of the workers who die. Under the present legislation, and it's basically the same across Canada, the person can choose to take compensation or to sue a negligent third party. And most of the cases are, for example, your truck driver driving down the highway, a tourist from New Jersey or Seattle or somebody forces them off the road. That person who forced them off the road was not an employer or a worker under the act. They weren't in the course of the employer. The truck driver can choose either to take compensation or to sue the driver of that motor vehicle. So where there's third party liability, there is a right to sue. An election must be made. If the person chooses not to sue and to take compensation, the compensation board inherits the person's right to sue that third party, and the board regularly does sue third parties. Unfortunately, the board doesn't regularly sue manufacturers of defective equipment and machinery. Okay. Hundreds, if not thousands, of legal actions okay. could have been taken in the last few yeah, years for those the, things and haven't been done, and that's an important prevention. The families of the, the victims who suffered through this gross negligence presently therefore collect basic compensation. From well, the board. not all of them, Jack. Uh, in one case, Brian Stevenson, who died, he had a, he was he had a fiance. They were planning to get married. They hadn't lived together long enough to qualify as a common law relationship, and he wasn't regularly financially supporting his mother. So therefore, neither his mother nor his girlfriend got compensation for his death. So one of the four workers, there's no compensation being paid at all, right? Leave now. that complication aside okay. for a moment, just for yeah, not well, being sympathetic. No, these are the no. variety the, of little things. That the happen. other three are getting are entitled to normal compensation from... Yeah, one woman with three children is getting $1,100 a month, Jack, okay, with three kids between the ages of 7 and 13. If she remarries next week, Jack, or, or next month, or next year, she loses that pension, that portion of the pension that's payable to her, which is about half of it, as soon as she gets married, or as soon as she starts to live with somebody else, and she gets paid out two years' value of the pension. I can understand all of that. I've had many complaints about that. These particular aspects of the compensation right. over the year, and not even the NDP government changed that aspect of the compensation act. Well, right? They, they changed some of it, but I mean, yeah. No. Sure okay, they didn't I want to get to the basic part. Okay. What is it? <laughs> well, what is it? Yes. <laughs> it's a variety. The basic of point things. is that what you're going to do is you're going to sue the third party. Yeah, either Probably. us or the board. The board's finally agreed to do that, that, I, that we can sue. The board controls that decision, you know. Okay, you can sue the third party. In the yep. meantime, do these families lose the current payments from the compensation board? If the normal rules applied, the families would have to choose to sue, their compensation payments would stop, 
everything that's been paid to them so far to the compensation board would have to be paid back. They would have to front the legal fees for the action. So what you want is a ruling from the compensation board or an interpretation <coughs> that this compensation continues and money is obtained from the grossly negligent designer from outside of BC be a separate insurance payment to family. Is that right? Over and above anything they receive from compensation. I've got so that. because if the if the families choose not to sue, then the compensation board will sue. If the compensation sues on their behalf, in the normal course, the compensation board takes twenty percent off the top of any recovery. We're asking them not to do that in this situation. And quite frankly, I don't see why they should do it in any situation. They're a public agency and they don't charge unions and workers when they prosecute companies for safety violations. And why, so why should they charge 20% to do it in public? Can, I can, Number I can. one. Number two, if they recover, say, two hundred and fifty dollars or $300,000 for each one of them, okay? Let's assume that. What I say they should do is then pay back the family, or the family pay back the board out of that $250,000, everything the family's been paid up to now, and give them the rest. Bango. Why not? The board doesn't lose anything by that. The, f the families who suffered the injuries get the money. That Question, does this to. need a change in the act? No. That... For any of this to happen, no, it doesn't. But the act should be changed to mandate this kind of I can see the horror the of the bureaucrats. So because what would happen if you were successful in this? Maintaining the payments, the board sues the outsider, the board gets the money, gives it over less reasonable expenditures. That means that there would be a vast increase in the number of third party actions on the behalf of people injured or killed under the compensation board regulations. Exactly, and so there should be. So there should Leave be. the point there. Don't confuse me. I think I've got it clear. After the break. You know, I lied to what we were going to talk about. There was a decision the other day of the Supreme Court of Canada in which... Correct me if I'm wrong. The court said that doctors enjoy the same status as store pigeons, as informers, and can, can be protected from giving information about me to the police. Apparently. I haven't read the judgment, but that's apparently what it says. Did that not stagger you? I think it's one of the worst decisions I have ever heard of out of the Supreme Court of Canada. If that's that saying is, something. If that, if, if that is right. But if that's that what is it correct, said. but that's what it seems to be. The court said that, it's, uh, that it may well be unethical, but it's not un illegal under the uh, Ontario Hospitals Act. And it, the doctor should be as upset about this as anybody. But I haven't heard anything out of the BCMA or the CMA about yeah, it. Yeah, I must do that. Now, the question I was going to ask you before that was a simple one. We've all, we're all overwhelmed with this overweening interest in access and freedom of information. And you people, you were a large part of it, won the battle to get the worker full access to compensation board files, correct? Well, yes, we haven't achieved it all, but we're getting there. Just to keep it simple, you've achieved most of it. We got it on appeals, right. Right, and then all of a sudden, it turns out the employers want access to, and you get up and you scream to high heaven. It's most unfair for employers not to have access to the same documents that you have access to under these recent rulings. How can you justify that kind of hypocrisy? Jack. Uh, just if I'm stupid, tell me. Okay, I'll tell you. First of all, the employers never publicly asked for it, Jack. You know what they did? They did a lot of backroom politicking about it that, that I've been told about. They didn't have the guts, Bill Hamilton, or any of the employers to come out publicly and ask for it and explain why, number one. Number two, there were there's only one province in Canada where the employers have any form of access to the files, and that's in Quebec since January 1980, where the Quebec government passed an amendment to the Compensation Act in Quebec to allow for it. Ontario was proposing to do it. I oppose the employers getting it in any event, whether it's done by statute or not. I think it's a bad policy. Ontario's proposing to do it by amending their statute. This board, under the old discredited regime, now replaced, turned it over to the employers on the theory that it was only fair that the employers get it as well as the workers, without forcing the employers to go to court to prove their right to it. Jack. But I'm infected by this theory. I mean, if the files are open, honest, and available to the worker, why shouldn't they be open, 
and available well, to them. I mean, give me a well, logical reason. You're the reason saying, is okay. This. The reason is this, Jack. There is a big difference between information, government information held by a person about that person being available to that person and information held by government agencies being made available to what is in essence a third party, the employer. You're talking about sending records out, Jack, that are going into personnel departments of huge impersonal corporations. That information is going to be used and abused in there, and if you don't think it is, you're being naive. It's going on now. It's going on well, all the well, time. This kind of information is getting out all over the to place. Put it, to put it number more, one. Just a minute. No, 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 number one. Okay. To put it more simply, your position is that certainly, yes, the worker and his lawyer are entitled to everything, right? Fair enough. Right. And that the only entitlement of the employer who pays the shot, in effect, or the public pays the shot through a tax on business. Right. Uh, is that the compensation board administration is in effect his trustee to look after the money and make sure it's expended properly. That's, yeah, you got is it. Is that right? Right. Why didn't you say so in the first place? Well, look, the employers don't need to have access to the files in order to fight compensation claims. They got the compensation board doing a job for them on that. They don't need to be directly involved. The other thing is that the employers use this information for all sorts of purposes. Yeah, I see the part. Okay, consciously and unconsciously. Yeah. And Jack, have you ever seen what's in a compensation board file? Yeah. There is more irrelevant, incorrect, third-hand information in there than you can shake a stick at. And it covers income information, employment histories, how you get along with your friends and neighbors and your family, your you drinking think? habits. Credit ratings. Everything. And a lot of it is very suspect. Well, I, I just want to hand okay, that over. Okay, okay. Without the consent of the All worker. right, okay. I wouldn't want to see that get back in the hands of the personnel manager for whom I work. <laughs> is that your point? <laughs> exactly. Aren't you lucky that I'm around to help you explain things more clearly? I, Jack, I, I'm forever grateful. I don't want the whole inquest into the things, but I felt kind of sorry when poor old Joe Miyazawa, whom I knew years ago as a union representative, got, uh, he resigned in a... What was that about? Well, the, the board executive director of medical services sent a letter to all the doctors of the province over his signature saying that he regretted the decision of the Court of Appeal giving workers the right to access to their files and that and implied that the way to deal with that is that the doctors could phone the board doctors and have an oral conversation with them on the telephone and that, of course, would be kept confidential. Obviously, that, that wouldn't wash. No, that, that wasn't... Uh the, board, the commissioners fired, or whatever, terminated the contract of the doctor, Dr. Gibbings. It then subsequently developed that, in fact, Commissioner Miyazawa had seen and, and authorized. And he had to go. And, and, of course, he had to go. And then Little's gone. Dr. Little is now gone, yes. New chairman. Is, uh, yes, Mr. Gibbons from the, Art Gibbons from the Labor Canada. He takes over the 1st of November as chairperson. And there's another new commissioner, a Bob Booker. Very good appointment by Mr. Heinrich, by the way. Who is Booker? He's a 37-year-old fellow who used to work as a rehab consultant at the Compensation Board and until recently has been the worker's advisor assisting workers in claims before the board. He knows the ins and outs of the system, and he's an honest fellow who has the respect. You're the first people. person who's ever said anything kind about Heinrich on this program ever at any time. Well, I, I mean, I can say some unkind things, mm -hmm. but, I mean, we credit where credit's due. Craig Patterson. I'm not going to plug your book. I, I'm <laughs> sick and tired of plugging books. <laughs> Assault on the Worker, Occupational Health and Safety in Canada. Two ninety-five. dollars 95 Canadian. No, no wonder you stammered when you said that. Sixteen ninety-five. Yeah. Good book? I think it's an excellent book, Jack. It's a good source book for people. It covers stress, heart disease, industrial disease, <laughs> workers' compensation. It has personal histories in there. And, uh, Advocate stopping smoking. Yeah. If I clean lifestyle. If I, if I sell a million of those, I'll I'll have enough to go to Hawaii for Christmas. Your name's not Devil. It's Patterson. <laughs> In legal joke. Let's take a few phone calls on the compensation board. You really have been quite uh, an illumination this morning, old chap. Well, thank you very much. Mind you, I helped you, but it's <laughs> after the break. Calls to Patterson. <laughs> Thank you.
John Crispo has been on later on, and he said to me just now, look, if the compensation board is trustee for the employer, and the individual employer is, should not see the record, surely the compensation board is trustee also for the worker, and the worker shouldn't see the records either. Well, I have my own answer to that, but what's yours? Well, I can give you a legal answer that, in fact, the board is not a trustee in law, uh, that they're a in government fact, the, regulatory agency. The guy who gets dumped would. on, especially if he doesn't have a union, is the worker. Yep. And the worker by himself, unless he can get a lawyer or he's got a union that's half decent and fighting compensation, is out on a limb and a shuffle to say there's a degenerated back it, disease because he's over 40 or something wrong with his cardiovascular system and they give him nothing. That's right. And in fact, uh, a good union, apart from a good lawyer, is the best guarantee of a good settlement from the compensation board. True or false? There's been a study done that indicated that union representation has been very helpful in helping people with cases. Fifty percent of the cases that are appealed are won. Fifty percent of them. Now that tells me something about the basic decision making at the board, primarily, and that is that the primary adjudication has to, that's the, con the point you have to concentrate on, is primary adjudication, making sure the best decisions are properly made at the beginning, so you don't need a sophisticated appeal system. On telephone calls and compensation, it's almost impossible to avoid specifics. Personal but we, histories, yeah. We might get through with some short, sharp ones on the topic, okay. I don't know. <coughs> Go ahead to Craig Patterson on the compensation board. Good morning, Jack. Good morning. Yeah, could uh, I possibly direct a question to you? Yes, there. Referring to uh, a claim? Yes, but give, give us the broad injustice of it as you see it without all the details. Okay, well, the thing is, I work on a tugboat, and uh, my regular schedule is a week on, week off. And uh, I put in a claim, I guess it was last May, and uh, I wasn't entitled to any claim on my second week, my week off. I'd like to know uh, why that is. Beca well, it's because the board has internal rules of dealing with people who work that way, who work on and off, people that work in fishing, people that work in uh, seasonal logging and that sort of thing. I don't understand it. Why, why wouldn't he, if he has a continuing disability, he'd get the compensation, wouldn't he? Yes, if he's got a permanent disability, if he's got a wage loss disability, he should get paid 75% of his average earnings at the date of disability. Whether they pay you... Uh, every week or they pay every two weeks should be irrelevant as long as you're getting 75% of your average earnings at the date of disability. Well, that's the answer to his question. Yep. What was your disability just by the way? It was uh, strain lower back muscles is what the problem was. The old back problems. Thanks for your call anyway. Go ahead, please. Yes, Jack. Good morning. Good morning. I'm not going to get into specifics, but I'm an ex-foundry worker. Uh, right. For uh, seven years in a foundry and when I was the chief steward in a shop and belonged to a Canadian union, one that's very well known here in the Lower Mainland, <laughs> replaced the steel workers. Yeah. And when, this, when the compensation board people come out, they told us they would switch from black sand to a chemical sand for making forms. And they told me right to my face, they said, there's 2,200 chemicals a year coming onto the market. We have no idea what you're breathing in and what it's doing to you. Since I've left there, there's been three people dropped dead in their 30s and 40s. I'm in my 40s. Now, what I ask you, and since I've left there a year ago, I am still coughing up black, black stuff out of my lungs. Now, when the compensation board people don't know what you're breathing, what is happening? Well, right up your alley in occupation, health and safety, and the workers' right to strike and circumstances like this. To get aware of the general circumstances yep, of this kind I, of thing. I know the foundry that he's talking about, too. What's the answer? Well, the, the man is correct. There have been, in fact, as I'm informed, 10 or 11 cases of uh, I think of it would particular... be more like 10 or 11 people. Uh, I'm not... That's right. That's right. Well, in that case, I understand the board has set up a... a is, is at least into the scene and is aware of the problem, and they're trying to prevent that problem. But, of course, the difficulty there is is that we should stop toxic or carcinogenic chemicals from coming into the workplace. That's right. a laugh. Well, I know. At the present time it is because we don't prohibit them from coming in. There is no carcinogen, Jack, prohibited from being in a workplace in British Columbia. Not one. We have uh, regulations on a few of them that there ought to be no contact or exposure. You mean something like dioxin? Uh, you, that's right. There is no carcinogen prohibited from being in a workplace in B.C. Well, perhaps it's not practical to, to 
ban every carcinogenic in the, in the atmosphere. No, I'm not saying What that. about safety procedures? Can they give you a little mask? They give you a little mask to wear that is not no more. It's good for maybe painting in your backyard. Well, that's that's really when you come down to these ish situations, that really has to be addressed by the workers in the union that work there, in contract negotiations with the employer and in getting the board to establish rules and regulations that apply to the whole foundry industry. And I don't know what the foundry industry has been doing about this, mm. but uh, they should be doing some research. Well, this is uh, obviously a major problem now and for the years ahead, and it's almost incapable of solution at the present time. No, it's not almost Jack. incapable of solution. It is capable of solution. It's unfortunately, the people who've got the lung problems and so on, they're going to need uh, First of all, you, medical care. First of all, you must identify the poison, right? That's right. Secondly, you must have the proper precautions if it can't be banned. If it can't be replaced by something else, that's right. But we don't put enough emphasis on replacing these things with something else. Thanks for your call. One more, one more question, Jack. Yes, yes. Yes, uh, if I went to a doctor what are, and, and found out that there is something in my lungs, what is my, uh, to your guest, what is my chances of going to the compensation board and saying, all right, this happened to me at but the seven years that I was in this foundry. Away you go, and if it's a lung problem, I would suggest you go to the St. Paul's Hospital, or the uh, Dr. Hogg, <coughs> Dr. Copeland, or Dr. Donovan up there. Thank you very much for your time, Can sir. he just do that? You're very enlightening. Much obliged. The other point, of course, is to be quite brutal and go back a little bit. I remember when the silicosis cases came, first came out, they couldn't prove it until the patient was dead. Is that yeah. not right? Yes, a lot of that happened, unfortunately. But there must have been some great improvements in the last few years in the handling of cases. Well, silicosis we've got a handle on, but a wide variety of other lung impairments, no, not necessarily. Okay, I think, have I taken four? Have I taken you? No, you haven't. Okay, you're the last call. Go ahead, please. Okay, thanks. Um, I just spent nine months out of the compensation board out in Richmond, the rehab clinic. And those people out there, first of all, those doctors out there, are not called doctors, they're called medical officers. And there's one out there in particular that's, that's been in a lot of trouble in this province, and I'm not, I'm not gonna mention- No names, no names. I won't, don't worry. But I don't even like the call. Yeah, well anyway, they, I've been off, I had been off nine months. Just a minute, I can't judge, I don't know anything about it. Anyway, you were off nine months, what was your problem? A sciatic nerve in my right hip. And what are you complaining about, your treatment out there? They, they, they strip you of all your, basically all your human rights. One rehab uh, service officer out there phoned my boss and told him that I, had, I was finished working for him. And I didn't even know. John Crispo is a political commentator, man of many parts. Most of his parts are in British Columbia at the moment. And I've left it to John Crispo this morning, who's going to take calls, say what he wants to. Say, off the top this morning. Kill Crispo. Well, Jack, why don't we start with Trudeau? He was uh, speaking to that dinner last night in Toronto. Uh, what do they call it? Confederation dinner that they have, uh, where the loyal liberals turn out at $175 a plate. And would you believe he's joined the converted? He's talking about restraint again and saying it's time the Canadian people restrain themselves. He even spoke of wage restraint, which may indicate another round of wage and price controls. Let's hope he's not that. I was going to say stupid, but it'd be dead wrong to move in that direction. But I think it's ironic, to say the least, that this man that has presided over budgets for the last uh, six years, ever higher budgets, is now coming out and saying it's time for the people to restrain themselves. I guess it's better to have him convert at some point, uh, but I think in, a, in some ways he's got his nerve, but I, I suppose you could say better late than never. What does he want to restrain? You, you suspected that there was a little hint in there that wage restraints might come down the pike in the budget? Well, I've been saying no. I don't believe it. They've they got enough bad medicine, or they should have enough bad medicine to give us without going for wage and price controls. And as I've said to you many times before, wage and price controls don't solve any problems, but they give the impression you're solving problems. And as I've said to you before, when the Liberal Party thinks it's really in trouble on the inflation front and it's got public opinion problems, it'll go for controls, not because they believe in them, but because they think the people want them. I still don't think we'll get them in this budget. I just can't believe it. I think what he's setting the stage for is, is a lot of restraint in the budget, possibly a tax increase. And possibly a cut back on these transfer payments to the provinces, which will hamper Medicare and all the CAP plans across the country. Oh, and universities. 
No, we don't get on to that. That's the one they're going to aim at. If they aim at anything, they'll hit us before they hit the. the, the if the they're smart, they'll aim at the universities. Well, I know that. We're going to don't on. We're not going to no, get no, on that I, lane. I'm not going to get on that. I'm merely going to say there's absolutely no public sympathy involved with those who run universities, as far as we, I know, we, in this country at this moment. We have a public relations problem, and I think we're number one on the hit list. Mm -hmm. So uh, the budget comes when? November the twelfth. Now the twelfth. If, if, well, I mean, they've postponed it so many times now, we presume it's the 12th. I don't think they dare postpone it again. They've been using the phony excuse of the premiers and the Constitution and any number of things. They could have brought in the budget any time they wanted. It has nothing to do with any of these other issues. Except it would steal the headlines from the other issues. That's part of the problem, or reduce the headlines in the Constitution. Well, maybe it'd be better that way. I mean, let's take the heat off the constitutional thing and deal with the real business of the country. We've been needing that for over a year now, and this would have been a blessed uh, example, be, well, useful quite, example. To be quite honest, I don't think anyone can deal with the business of the country in any manner acceptable to the majority of the voters in the country. Well, no, that's true. You never can please everybody, but you still have to make decisions. There's no avoiding a budget. You have to make some hard decisions, and they've got some hard ones to make. One of the hard decisions that must be made, whether it's economic or uneconomic, whether it's practical or unreal, <coughs> I was at a thing yesterday, and I got one smidgen useful fact out of this consumer's luncheon put on by Peter Heinemann yesterday. It must have cost the taxpayers a couple of thousand dollars to put on this. For consumer. the consumers? Well, it was for the kind of uh, cream of the crop consumers. Not right. because I was there, but because all the customers of consumer affairs were there. Right. You know, the lawyers, the uh, bankers, uh, and business in town. The professional consumer advocates. Are the professional consumer recipients of corporate services, oh. etc., cetera, etc., cetera, right. ad okay. nauseum. But as somebody said yesterday, and I hope the figures are right, as of now, there are 12,000 mortgage renewals a month coming up in this country. Mm -hmm. 12,000 mortgage renewals a month. And people don't panic on their mortgage renewals until it happens to them. Right. When you get these 12,000 mortgage renewals per month, gosh, five months, 60,000 new ones. The consumers get another job, cut all their consumer spending to meet the mortgage. Exactly. Ipso facto, I would expect political reality will dictate, that's a good phrase, uh, a subsidized mortgage in the federal budget of some kind to take some of the cream off the pie for the banks. Well, there may be something, but it's going to be costly, and they don't have that much money to spread around. You're, you're citing the accurate figures. Uh, and, and I'm very much aware there was a, a meeting, uh, was it earlier this week, of what I would describe as a th 1,000 tiny Tory twits in London, Ontario. Uh, when you get that group coming out in London, Ontario, all homeowners uh, you fearing... You mean tiny Tory twits? That's you London, know Ontario. tiny Tory twits? I, I lived in Ontario, uh, London, Ontario for a year. If There's nothing West, else there. If it was West Vancouver, you'd say West Vancouver wimps, wouldn't you? Uh, I don't know them well enough. But, but because if, you're if, far if, away from Windsor, you can no, afford to use no, the speech and say tiny Tory twits. Jack, I use the same expressions when I'm in Ontario as I do here. I'm not running for any election, remember? I can say what I New think. Westminster Nits. I ha Vancouver if that's, Vegetables. I haven't been able to West come up Van with those Wimps. terms. West Van Wimps. If you say so, I'm with you. I Chilliwack, I, I, Chilliwack I, Chumps. Oh, well. And it, yeah, there's a good one for you. All right. Well, I haven't... Sardis Sillies. Would you, if you just, people out there, these are his, not mine. I, I don't know I'm these really people well I'm enough to give... I'm ludicrous. Your, your ton of phrases, no, it tiny isn't. Tory you, twits. You haven't been in London, Ontario for a year. You've either been meeting with or reading fathering him again. No, I haven't. I haven't. <laughs> but I, if, anything that rubs off from him, I'll be glad to take. Don't Look, we've tell got a middle me class. tiny Tory twits from the object of renewing the market. My point is it's London, Ontario where you're getting a thousand people out. That's serious. They're getting rebellious. Does they're that getting mean mad. they're twits? In London, Ontario, yes. Where are you from again? Toronto. Toronto. I'm a tiny oh, Tory no, twit. Oh, no, you're a tiny, <laughs> tiny Toronto toady. <laughs> toady, all right. I don't give a damn what you call me. Tell My point is... Quiet, please, John. Tell Crisper what you think of him after the break. I'm leaving. <laughs> Significant, there are not many calls, but there are some here. There's nobody from London here. Go ahead. Hello, Dr. Crispo? Yes. Go ahead, ahead. ma'am. Hi, Dr. Crispo? Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm, I'm calling about your comments earlier in the week about the uh, laid back students at SFU that, you know, they just don't seem to measure up to the Eastern students. And I detect real 
Eastern snobbery. That's what came through to me. Oh, well, I'm not, I don't tend to be a snob either Eastern or otherwise. And let's put it in perspective. I simply said that in one of the courses I've got at SFU, I imposed demands on the students with they and some of my faculty, fellow faculty members told me we're over and beyond the normal burden for a half year course. So I reduced correspondingly. And I think that does indicate that uh, the, the, it's a little tougher right now in some courses at the University of Toronto. If you want to generalize from that to all BC students and all Ontario students, I wouldn't say that. I've had this one experience. By the way, in that class, I've since had two student presentations, and they both were good. Great. That's all I wanted to say. It's just that, that, that when an Easterner comes out here and he talks, it, it, it's always the same thing. A few years ago, uh, a lady politician was out here who left her field and failed out here, and she was a lovely woman. She's passed away since. And I was shocked when I read her comments about B.C. when she was back in Toronto that, you know, you couldn't get anything done on the coast because, you know, it's three and four hour lunch hours and everybody is, you know, really Californian and, and out skiing and swimming and not doing their job. Well, let me just say when the ski season comes, I'm going to join who, whoever is out there. But, I, you know, I, I didn't make that kind of sweeping generalization. Okay. Go ahead. Yes, now I'd like to ask two questions. First, about the balance of wealth. Now, I was helping a young businessman project for the next few years on his business a couple of years ago, and we decided then that the economy could only keep growing two years because the balance of wealth in the few hands was getting very, very close to what it was in 1929. And we felt that the when as soon as the Bank of Canada raised their rates, we thought that's the straw that'll break the camel's back. Because you know, you can't play poker when one person has all the chips. And another thing, I was wondering if there was any laws or to protect people against usury. Because I noticed that the, all the big uh, uh, companies, Eaton, the Bay, so on. 24% now on credit cards. 28.8%. How much? 28.8% on their bills, and all of those are, uh, there's a lot of young people. I mean, not myself, but I know... Oh, a nightmare. Okay, give John a chance to answer. Well, I'm not sure what you mean by balance of wealth. I suppose you're, you're, you're not just talking about the distribution of current income flows, but... The wealth in a few hands. Well, I don't think it's changed that much recently. I wouldn't defend the existing distribution of wealth in this country. I think it is unequitable. I'm not sure it's changed that much in the last few years. Well, I guess what I mean. Uh, your point about uh, interest rates rising so high that we get in trouble, it is noteworthy that real interest rates, that is the difference between the rate of inflation and interest rates, the nominal interest rates, is higher than it's ever been since 1931. Yes. It's very high, and, and that is slowing things down. We can see it on all sides. Consumer spending's down, I think investment is going to show serious signs of lagging. And, and if we persist with these rates, we obviously are going to slow things down, but we've been doing that deliberately to try to stop inflation. We, we've got a terrible dilemma on our hands. But we haven't yet come to the situation which I found in Britain this summer, whereby people, when they get their paycheck, go out determined to spend it all because it's going to be dealer tomorrow. We haven't quite come oh, to no, that no, state. No, no we're, getting, we're, we're not there. People are, are still saving in this country, we're worried about the future. Uh, so I don't, think, I don't think it's quite as dire as you're indicating, but if we project these uh, high interest rates too far into the future, we'll have real problems. We've got to solve the thing fairly soon. Thank you. Nobody knows how to solve it, of course, but we've got to solve it. We've got to impose demands, one of John's favorite phrase, to solve. No, no, no. I've never said impose demands. There's a whole host of things we have to do. There is no one sim simple answer. There's very few things in where, which we're doing in this country to tackle it. Go oh, ahead. Alder Grove, go ahead. Good morning, Jack. Good morning, Mr. Crispo. Good morning. morning. Jack, I think one of the reasons we don't go out and spend our, spend our paycheck like we do in Britain is because it's probably spent before we get it with our mortgage rates like they are these days. <laughs> Good point. Touche, as we, we say. really phoned up to call about was Mr. Crispo's opinion on the federal government's refusal to control its own civil servants, their individual work patterns or lack of work patterns, the sheer amount of them, and just how much we waste in that point. Well, first of all, uh, let me say something about the federal government that's half positive and, and then say something uh, a little more negative. Uh, I think the recent records show that they have been holding the line on civil service appointments. They're still increasing them, but nothing like the rate they used to be. Uh, the other, the, on the other side of the coin, if you're worried about inequity, I think one thing the public of Canada has every right to be upset about is that index pension plan of the federal public servants. 
There's nothing wrong with an index pension plan if we want to pay for it, but if we're going to have one, let's have it for all of us and we'll go bankrupt together. And we don't necessarily have to do it. It's an income transfer from one generation to the other. But to have just index pension plans for federal civil servants is, is very unfair, especially when the principle of public service collective bargaining, generally speaking, is that public servants should follow private trends. It's a double standard that I find unforgivable. Good. I do said it, not me. Take some heat off me. See you next week, Chris Paul. John. Right. I shall impose demands on you. Great. After the break. The search is underway at the foot, the bottom of M Creek on the highway beyond Lionsgate to Squamish. No further bodies have yet been found. Reporter Steve Wyatt was out there this morning with our camera crew. This is the first thing we saw this morning, Jack. Work crews have been working around the clock trying to install a new Bailey Bridge over M Creek. That's the creek that flooded out. They expect to have it done perhaps tomorrow afternoon, probably Saturday. There we can see the, the Bailey Bridge. Just uh, coming up the right out. hand side. And now there's one car. Now that tailgate, they're still looking for the truck that it belongs to, and it's probably in the water. That's a searcher there going down to the water now. You mean a truck apart from that blue car? That's which right. I haven't seen a pickup truck they're now. still looking for. What's train, happening here? Train tracks are open again, and new passenger trains are going through, added ones to get people down to the lower mainland from Squamish. That's one of the cars yesterday, and this blue LTD, four people were inside, three survived miraculously, and Brian Coxford of the News Hour talked to them yesterday. The, the bridge just crumbled, you know, there was, uh, you couldn't go left, you couldn't go right, it was pouring rain, it was pitch black, and, uh, you know, there, once, uh, you know, I put on the brakes, but uh, once the tires aren't touching pavement anymore, there's really not much you can do. It just sort of no, nosedived into the hole. Can you tell us, uh, Joe, your thoughts and, uh, you know, just sort of what you saw and what you were thinking at the time? Well, the, there wasn't a lot of uh, time for thought. Um, you know, I figured, uh, you know, it's a totally uncontrolled situation. That, you know, there's, there's nothing you can do. Just sort of wait until we hit the bottom and then just, you know, try to pick up the pieces from there, see what we can do. We were, like, when we started going down and rolling a second time, I thought we were going down the river. And everything just flashed. I, I thought, no, I'm pretty young to die. I didn't want to do that sort of thing. I just, I don't know. Pretty shaky experience, wasn't it? Yeah, it's not something I'd want to do again, you know. Tragically, though, one woman inside the car did die. Yeah, that record is still there. I thought she'd taken out, uh, uh, thought she'd taken off out of the car because I wouldn't want, I didn't want to believe that she had was trapped inside or something. You know? So then I, Joe, after we got him out, told um, me that. She was pinned underneath there, and he saw her hand and that sort of thing. She was buried and pinned in the mud, and not to tell Tracy sort of thing. And then that's when I sort of cracked up. <laughs> and this uh, was the scene yesterday, Jack, as our helicopter flew over M Creek. Uh, still today, they're trying to figure out what caused the slide. The predominant theory is that there was a log jam up on top. It gave way, the artificial dam gave way and pushed a wall of mud right down the cliffs and over the bridge. The terrifying thing is that the creek, after it cleared itself by knocking out the bridge, I mean, you're fairly high up on the mountain there, it's still, at the bridge level, a fairly small kind of inoffensive creek. That's right. But you can see if there's a log jam anywhere up the creek, whether it was natural or caused by logging, and into some kind of natural bowl in no time at all, it would fill itself up into a oh, massive yes. collection of water, mm -hmm. sweep down in a solid body with the mud and the rocks, and that would be that. And as they clear it away today, you can still see Next the Next comes logs. all the inquiries. Uh, when the bodies are recovered, all the inquests, the inspections by the highways department of every wooden bridge in British Columbia, hopefully. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's no word yet, of course, about any detailed inquiries from the highways minister. No word of that yet. I think they're still just trying to get the place All the regional engineers. And I don't suppose, as of this moment, there was any way, 
unless you'd had a watch on every bridge every night because of the heavy rain mm -hmm. to know whether or not there was a build up there. Well, that's right. I mean, there's no way of telling, although they do patrol the area up above the road on, on a regular basis. Yes. When it goes, it goes. You can't, in the rain. Heavy rain, mm -hmm. completely heavy rain. No indication on the bridge until the underpinnings no. went. No. I must say, though, that I know that the, there are a fair number of wooden bridges of that trestle type throughout British Columbia. And especially along that one road. There are two more, I believe, on that yes. section of the highway, wooden yes. bridges. Mm -hmm. What do you do? Put up some kind of automatic warning system, close them and replace them with Bailey bridges now before it happens again? But with our weather, you can't close them all the time. No, you That's can't. Right. And it was, what, 60 years ago yesterday that that dreadful thing came through mm -hmm. uh, Britannia, wasn't it? Yes, that's right. It killed 30 odd people. Mm -hmm. News Hour, of course, is on the scene with its cameras and we'll give you full reports uh, at noon and later on the tragedy at Lions Bay. My thanks to Steve Wyatt. Who was your cameraman this morning, Grant? Grant Faint. And I'll be back after the break. Just a couple of things I want to check with you, Steve, who was out at the M Creek disaster this morning. The bridge was moved into position only yesterday, am I That's correct? right, and they've been working all night. Oh, all night. It was part way across when you were there this morning. That's right. Uh, they had to fly in parts from other parts of the world. Yeah, some from Britain, Ireland, all, all kinds of places. They've been some makeshift thing. They're trying to get it done as quickly as possible. And on the spot, they hope to complete it when? Well, they say tomorrow afternoon is what they would like to have it completed by, but it more likely it will be Saturday before you'll be able to drive over it. I mean, your common sense tells you it'll be Saturday before yeah, anybody can right. go over that bridge. That's right. But in the meanwhile, the rail line is open. The rail line is open and extra trains. At first thing yesterday, they thought that bridge was because over the rail trestle, a bridge over Yahoo Creek had been mm -hmm. washed out. In fact, it had merely been covered by the spreading of the slide the all mud. over that. Well, some say a 40-foot wall of mud was and trees and logs were coming down there. Well, it, have to be far, well, it wouldn't have to be 40 foot to take out the bottom, but it would be yeah, about 40 be foot. Quite tall, yeah, quite tall. Well, these things happen. Natural disasters are mm. always, if it is That's a natural, right. it is a natural disaster, yes. no matter what happens. Tomorrow morning, uh, I have as uh, my guest on the program, Premier Bill Bennett of British Columbia. He is due in Ottawa for the Key Talk next week. And Bill Bennett is going to be with us tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. And I've got a few questions to ask him apart from the Constitution, but we'll of course hit at the Constitution. 9 a.m. precisely. <laughs>
Hold on. Don't make me out looking. 